What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the No Rain, No Rainbows podcast. As always, we appreciate you taking the time to join us today. We know it's going to be a valuable episode. And shout out to my executive producer, Andre Settles, Settle Solution Media, for helping to make this podcast possible. Today, we have an exciting episode for you guys as we welcome on CEO and founder of Morrow Capital, or what I should have started with, father of four. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Joel Gandara on the podcast. Thanks for joining us today, Joel. Hey, Ted. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's a, it's a pleasure, and I'm, I'm excited to jump into today's subject matter. But first, I always want to make sure that our audience and, of course, the guest have an opportunity to get acquainted. So please uh, take the floor for a little bit, explain a little bit who you are, where you come from, and what brings you here today. Sure. I'll make it quick and painless. Came here from Cuba as a kid on a boat. As a refugee, grew up very poor in the United States, but a great place to grow up poor because there's nowhere to go but up and the opportunities are there. I hustled all my way through school. I sold trading cards, I sold chocolates. Uh, I bought all my own toys uh, once I was, I don't know, about 12 years old. Uh, been paying all my own stuff since I was 16 completely. And uh, I took jobs, I took two jobs. I'd worked two full-time jobs out of high school, did that for a while. And then I got into underwear. I started selling underwear. How did I find the underwear? I went to a garage sale. I would go to garage sales and buy stuff and take it to the flea market. And that's what I did. And I found a brand that sold me, a guy who sold me samples that were left over from a collection. And then I got a brand out of Mexico to give me their distribution. And then I went from there and I grew it. Didn't know what I was doing, but I figured it out. I got some help from some mentors wherever I could. Retired from day to day at 39, became a multimillionaire just after 30 years old. Uh, married, four kids. Got my wife to stop working as a registered nurse at 30 years old. That was a huge accomplishment for me before I was able to retire. Nice. And now I coach entrepreneurs. It's what I've been doing for the last two and a half years. And I absolutely love it. I love it, man. And the fact of the matter is you fit that all within 30 to 60 seconds. And this is, that's probably the definition of easier said than done. Because <laughs> I can only imagine uh, what that journey must have been like. But let's let's go way back into the mindset. Because... When, when you talk about being uh, a kid or a young teen s selling baseball cards or finding um, merchandise, underwear in, at, a, at a garage sale and, and flipping and, and selling it, you know, it begs the question, where did that entrepreneurial mindset originate and come from? Yeah. So I knew one thing growing up just outside of Oakland, California, in a very rough neighborhood. I heard gunshots all the time. From my high school, three guys uh, went to jail for murder. Not in one time. These were separate events. That's where I graduated from. That's a neighborhood I grew up in. And I knew one thing. I did not want to be there. I, I wanted to get out of there. Every day I'd look around and say, this isn't me. I don't belong here. Um, so so that that's something that triggered that, that want, need, that want to get out of there. And you know what? When I think, now that you said it, I thought something jumped in my mind for a second. In the 80s, there was a show called Silver Spoons with a kid named Ricky Schroeder. And he was rich. And his dad owned a toy company. And it was amazing. And then there was a show called Different Strokes. And those type of shows always made me think like, man, they live in a penthouse or the Jeffersons or whatever. They, they went from poor to having this amazing life. And that always motivated me. So I always imagined I'm going to have a circular driveway and a big house. So it, it kind of gave me that vision of something bigger I wanted to accomplish. So then what comes next? The action steps to get there. And for me, those steps were do what I could. And it, fortunately, it wasn't selling drugs or doing anything too crazy, but it was selling trading cards. It was selling chocolates. It was going to garage sales and making money like that. So that's, I think, where I came from. Yeah. Looking up and wanting to move over to the east side and say, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> that's the motivation <laughs> <laughs> that, that pushes it. I, I could definitely relate. Now, you mentioned being from Cuba. And, and something I, I think is similar in our stories, both of my parents are from Haiti. Growing up, my mom, a registered nurse, my dad commuting into the city from Long Island into New York City. I watched them my whole life be the hardest working people I know. Um, but that's also where the definition of, you know, if, you know, work hard for success didn't really make sense to me because if that were the case, the hardest working people I, would, I know would be the richest people I know. Um, I'm interested for you watching your parents come to a new country, provide a life for you for an opportunity of what could be a successful future. What lesson did that teach you? And what did that kind of put it into you as you were kind of looking to in improve yourself and maybe open up some doors? 
Yeah. So I took what my parents taught me and that got me to a certain point. Then I had to add a little bit more to it to accomplish what I've been able to accomplish. And to put it into perspective, I calculated this once. Um, in the best year that my, ever, my parents combined in income ever had is what I earn in two weeks wow. on my average year, right? So, so I, they gave me something, but then obviously, like I said, I had to take it further. What I got from my parents was put the head down and just go to work. And that's what they did every single day. And then obviously no help in the house or nothing. So when my parents would get home, my mom had a physical job. She went from being a physics teacher in Cuba to cleaning hotel rooms in San Francisco at the Sir Francis Drake Hotel. She did that for a little while. And then she got a job at a radio station doing manual labor, uh, recording cassettes and you know just duplication and all this hard work. And when my mom got home, she cooked, she cleaned. She, she did the laundry. She, she didn't stop until it was like 10 o'clock at night. And then she'd crash in the bed. And she mm -hmm. did it again every single day. Uh, my dad, he was an electrician. So he would, but when he got here, he didn't get a job as an electrician. He got here as like a fixing people's equipments and, you know, whatever he could do, hustling on the side. And then he got a, a job, very low. My parents never made great money, low paying job. Um, but then on the side, my dad would make some lamps, you know, make a lamp out of a plastic horse, mm -hmm. put a pole through it, some cables, a, a light bulb, and he'd have a lamp. And at church, out of the trunk, after church, he'd open it in the, in the parking lot and sell lamps. And so I saw that all the time. I saw that hustle. So what I did, so oh, the other thing I learned from it, so work really hard. My parents did that. And the second thing is, I've never seen my parents spend a dollar unless it's on necessary food, necessary clothes. Unfortunately for them, because they're the first ones who got here. I was a kid, uh, but they came as adults with responsibilities and two kids. They couldn't enjoy it. Yeah. Now they've retired and they're comfortable and they paid off their house and they get to vacation and all that. But man, when they were grinding for those 30 years, 30 something years, there was no stopping to enjoy it. What I did was take a little bit more risk. My parents were not in a position to take risks. I was. So I was able to do things a little bit more. You know, I, I bought my first house at 22 years old. They didn't get to this country till they were 30. So I already had major advantage over them. And what did I do? I rented out the bedrooms in that house. I kept the master bed and bathroom for myself. Those two other people paid my entire mortgage. I was 22 years old, getting a house paid for. So at 23, I bought another one. At 24, I bought another one. At 25, I bought my next one. So I had a major advantage because I got here earlier and I got to learn the language a lot faster and because I got to earn and save. Yeah, man, Joe, I love how analytical and, and kind of direct you are with that, with that upgrading in terms of one house, second house, third house. But it's almost as if you saw my line of questioning because with the first question of what did you learn from your parents coming from Cuba and working hard? My next question is, what did you learn not to do from your parents? Because I do think there is a truth to that where our parents, they, they, they raise us based on the lives that they were, were raised in. They know the world that they lived in and they give us the tools for the appropriate time. At some point in time, we need to kind of reassess where we are. And like, as you mentioned, my parents, my parents got me very far, but there is a certain distance that if I choose to go, I'm going to have to seek the counsel, the advice and, and the mentorship of some other folks to navigate the current waters in which I'm in, because my parents can only navigate the waters which they've known. That leads me to the question though, of, of kind of mentorship and coaching um, at one point I saw, you said you were working over a hundred hours a week. Um, this is in high school. No, it's, I was, uh, from 19 to 22. I killed myself. My record was 109 hours, one job from Sunday to Saturday, one pay period. I hit 109, but I was hitting a hundred. I was hitting 90 regularly. That's how I bought a house at 22. Okay. So I was going to say, before we ask the question for mentorship and whatnot, why the hundred hours a week what was the motivation behind that did you ever think of taking a pause along the way or what was the focus was it just a pure focus on getting the house or was something else pushing you yeah i believe so much and i mentioned it a little while ago here's the goal here's what i want to accomplish but here's who i am here's where i am today what's the step boom boom boom, boom. and i did the math i was 19 years old finished high school recently before that got it my first real job eight bucks an hour and uh and i started doing the math and I go, okay, if I can work, my, they only gave me three shifts, 24 hours a week. And if I can work really hard, they'll give me another one. Then they gave me full time. And then they said, you know what? We're willing to pay you overtime. But can you work these extra shifts? I never said no. I did 24 hour shifts. I'd go home for four, come back and do another 24. I killed myself, but I had a goal. Though. I had a reason. There was this drive here. Why did I want, and it was a house. And why did I want to buy a house? Because it mean I'd be independent. 
didn't have to live under my parents' roof. I was a man. I was 19, 20, 21. I wanted to get out. And, um, and I wanted to get out of that bad neighborhood that I grew up in. So that was a huge motivator for me. My brother, I have an older brother. He taught me something. When I first started earning money, he, I said, hey, you know what I want to do? A lot of my friends are buying old cars from the 50s and 60s and 70s and fixing them up. I kind of want to do that. And my brother said, what do you need? And he goes, May, I said, maybe 3000 Okay. He goes, tell me when you're at $3,000. And then let's see if you still want to buy the car or if you say, huh, I'm getting kind of close to buying a house and maybe you'll switch your mind. I said, all right. And then I told him, I don't know, three months later, I go, I got 3000 in the bank. And he said, you're so close to buying a house. You did that in three months. Why don't you just hold off on the car and buy a house? And then he told me his story. And he goes, look, remember I moved out when I, he was 23, he bought his first condo, he rented out one of the rooms, it paid for everything. And he goes, and I get, I'm not in mom and dad's house anymore. I'm a free man. I can do whatever I want. Don't you want that? And I go, you're absolutely right. Forget the car. So I kept my thousand dollar car and, and drove it for three years and saved up and got to the, to the, what I wanted to accomplish. And that's the way I've lived my life. And yes, I wanted to take breaks. And yes, I wanted to call out sick when I knew I had a sinus infection and I hadn't slept more than three hours a night, but I kept saying, but I'm going to lose the money. And my boss isn't going to like me as much. He's not going to give me as many shifts and I'm not going to hit my goal. I went to work. I don't care how I felt. That's, that's amazing. And what I'm getting from you is a clarity of desire. And when I say clarity of desire, so many folks, they have a hard time starting because they don't know what they're going after in the first place. They don't, they, don't set the, they don't set the aim, so they never shoot. And they find themselves stagnant in life of, okay, I don't know where to go. And I, I, I mean, I'm not a big fan of just, you know, throwing things on the wall and see if it sticks. But for someone who's, who's stuck and doesn't have an aim, you know, I'm like, aim at something. <laughs> you know something, because, anything action just take action yeah aim at something because what happens is you might just find out you could hit it and when you realize you could hit something you might get more intentional on in what you aim at and then really start getting the confidence behind what you're looking for and with the with the story of your brother teaching you about saving until you have the car and seeing if you still want it and then going through with buying the house, sounding like it's something he did before. Was that one of your first, I guess, mentors or first, uh, I guess, teachers in terms of how to start scaling up? And, and how did that manifest into more official mentor-mentee relationships and coaches in your life? And how did that benefit you? Yeah, so at that point, I was around 20, and I, I probably didn't know what a mentor was, a coach, any, any of that stuff. It didn't exist in my world, in my neighborhood, in the mid-90s but you grab lessons from wherever you can. I've been to conferences that I didn't love. I've read a thousand books, probably I didn't love all of them, but I, there's always a nugget that you can get from everything if you're open and, and, and willing to listen. So yeah, that was a time where my brother definitely gave me some great advice. Um, you know, and there've been other moments. My uncle would always go to garage sales and buy stuff and take it to the flea market. He was a mailman for 30 something years, but that's what he did on his weekends. And I learned from that and I did some of that. That's what helped me get my business off the ground and, and get going when I was a young man. So didn't have an official mentor until I was late twenties. So at that point, no official mentor yet, but, but yeah, I started getting those and hiring coaches later on. Yeah. Now I asked this question for folks who, who hear the clarity of the action behind everything that you're doing. And I'll be honest, man, it sounds go, 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 go. And and for a lot of people, they, they start to get a sense of what they'd call maybe burnout or just exhaustion and, and maybe not be able to maintain. What would you say to somebody that kind of sees their momentum flickering a little bit or faltering a little bit? How would you advise them on getting through that hump? Yeah. So it's kind of something we just talked about. And about an hour ago, I got off a coaching call from a gentleman with a very successful Amazon business. And... And he asked me specifically today, we've talked for months that I've been coaching him. He asked me, well, don't you have moments that you don't want to get up and do it? Whatever that thing is, right? So for me, it's not business anymore. I own businesses and I have teams that run them, but I'm not in the day-to-day. -day. I don't have an office. I don't have a computer. I don't have anything. This laptop, I took the dust off to open it up to talk to you. So I, I don't have the day-to-day -day grind. So my new day-to-day -day grind is jujitsu tournaments, ultra marathon races, you know, those things that I sign up for and then I accomplish them. This morning, I woke up with a sore neck because I got thrown around by a higher belt who weighs 80 pounds more than me last night at jujitsu. This morning, I did not want to go to jujitsu. I woke up, my neck was sore. And then I said, 
ah, December 11th, I have a tournament. I'm going to jujitsu. I did not want to. My, everything in my body and my weak brain was saying, don't go. This is better for you to just relax. And I almost said the words to my wife this morning. I'm going to stay home. Nope. I have a tournament, right? So that's all that popped in my mind. The worst thing for me, I can either have the pain of the discipline that I have to have every day, or I can have that pain of regret on December 11th when I get on the mat and I get crushed by someone that I should be beating, right? So that way of thinking is what's helped me, but that always requires having a magnet. The magnet is that goal that pulls me toward it. And it erases the, I don't feel like it, and the, I'm tired. You know, I've gone on 30 mile runs, straight, nonstop, 30 miles. Sometimes you don't wanna do that. Sometimes your body doesn't feel like doing that. But guess what? I'm training for another big race. I have two big races in the next six months. One's a 50 miler. I gotta train because guess what? When I had my, calm moment. I'm not in the moment. I don't do things in the moment. When I'm sitting down, do I want to do a 50 mile race in April? Yeah, I want to do it. When I made that decision, that's it. It's on. There's no, well, you know, the feeling, there's no feelings because it's in my calendar and every workout, all of them, all five runs a week are in my calendar. I don't get an opinion on that. It's in my calendar. I put it there under a normal, nobody put a gun to my head and I go, oh, I got to do six miles today. I got to do 12 miles. Today. I do what it says in my calendar. That's it. Oh man, that's awesome. Cause I, I live and die by my Google calendar. And if this podcast interview was not listed at two o'clock, you probably would have missed me. <laughs> um, me <too. laughs> um, you mentioned this before about not being in the day to day. And, and I mentioned this because for a lot of our listeners, they're in a lot of different levels of their journey, myself being included in that journey, which is why I enjoy these conversations. Um, is learning how to take ownership of our lives and of our time. And I think the 100 hours a week, first of all, amazing, crazy. I can relate because folks will look at me and even my wife will tell me, okay, when are you going to stop working? For a lot of folks, it's, uh, it's a fantasy. Uh, I'm going to stop working when I get to this, I get to that. And so few actually make that turn to get some of their time back. How would you advise folks to actually start making the action steps to go from being within their business and go from working in their business to working on their business? Yeah, so a lot of things have to happen for you to get there. I didn't just one day desire it. In fact, what happened is I took the right steps, but I didn't know those were the right steps. Then the results started happening and I go, how come there's nothing for me to do here? And my second in command told me one day, why don't you just start going home, man? There's nothing for you to do here. And there wasn't. I started realizing that I got rid of my desk. Then I got rid of it. And I started thinking, I'm not really needed here. It almost happened by accident. But when I look back, I go, oh, I did all the right things. See, so it starts this way. I did not waste a minute. I didn't have cable until I was 25 years old. Never saw cable until 25 years old. And it was on accident because I bought a condo in Miami and I moved from California to Miami and a neighbor's telling me, did you see on HBO last night? I go, I don't have cable. He goes, what are you talking about? All of us do, all the people who have a condo here. He goes, there's cable here? I'd lived there three months. That's so I plugged in, I go, oh, we have cable. I didn't know that. First time I ever had it. I don't have cable today. My kids don't know cable. Uh, we don't waste time. So I, I, I always hear excuses and then I peel back with my questioning and I find certain things. People are wasting time. They're wasting money. They're wasting their energy. They're doing all these negative things and then wondering why they're not at that next level. Well, I didn't even know what the next level was at many of those points, but I wasn't wasting the time. I wasn't wasting the money. I just kept reinvesting in myself and in my business. And before I knew it, oh yeah, we're doing a few million a year. We're clearing a million net profit. We're doing, I don't need to work that much. You know, I'm already fulfilled. I, I don't need to make 22 million a year in profit. I don't need all this. That's when I could start stepping away and rewarding employees of mine who deserve it and pay them more and make them, I pay them in large part on the PL, on the bottom of the profit and loss. That net profit, they get paid a percentage of that, my key employees. That means they're going to worry about turning the lights off. That means they're going to worry about getting rid of a bad vendor, hiring better people. They're going to run better without me. And that's how, that's how that happened. Yeah. Hey, share the fruits with those who bear it, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's. Yeah. Let's talk about the motivation after the house is acquired, after you get to step away from your business and now you have the time. Um, what do you do with your time? I know you mentioned ultra marathon running, uh, jujitsu. I don't know why, but running 30 miles and then getting beat up 
does not sound like something I would do in my leisure time. <laughs> but yeah. now that you have the control of your time, you're able to do some of these things. But where was the motivation to keep going? I know the goals in your calendar are important. And those are kind of the commitments that you make to yourself that you keep. But where does the ambition come from for that next level for the scaling up of the business or for, you know, making more free time for whatever it might be that you want to do? Where does the focus go to when most of the goals are hit? To answer that, I'd probably have to know what's deep down in there that's making or in here that just keeps pushing me like that. Honestly, I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. All I know is that I keep wanting to get better and I keep like, I like to see improvement and growth. That gets me up in the morning, like super excited, as opposed to if I had a government job and every day was the same and I knew when I got my next little 3% raise and I knew, or a corporate job, or something, that would bore me to death. I did that up until about 29 years old. And then my side thing was big enough to get rid of my regular job, which was always my dream. That, that almost seemed like one day in my life, even if I'm 40 or 50, if my side gig can match my regular job, then I can quit. That's all I wanted to do. So yeah. today, I don't know what the obsession is. I read a lot of books. I do audio books while I run so I can hit the physical improvements and the mental improvements. I, I go to seminars. I have lunch and breakfast and, and, and coffee with a lot of amazing people just so I can keep learning. I'm obsessed with improvement. And maybe it's my obsession. I don't drink alcohol. I've never tried a drug. I've never done any of that. But my addiction is growth and improvement in whatever yeah. avenue. Because I really believe, tell me how you do anything. I'll tell you how you do everything. I want to be the absolute best husband I can be. It's about to be 20 years. And we are absolute best friends, my wife and I. Got four kids, uh, 16 down to eight. And I think I'm a pretty good dad. They say I am. And I, and I, so I focus on that. I just want to be great at everything that I do. Yeah. I I'm a big proponent of growth as well. And I think, uh, I mean, many folks have heard the quote where, you know, so many of us die at 25, but we don't get buried until we're 75 because we get stagnant and, and we just stop growing. And, and if anyone's listening to the podcast, Joel, I'll tell you, you're, you're preaching to the choir right here because this podcast is pretty much based on someone who's, stopped for a second, looked around, noticed they've been in the same spot for God knows how long, and they're, they're looking to get out. They're looking to change their current circumstances. Let's start from a blank slate, right? And speak to that listener directly, who's realizing they've been stagnant in their career or wherever they are in life. They don't have that growth around them. They're not sure what to do next. What would you tell them? What would be the first few action steps to start taking control of their lives and get, get out of this, this hamster wheel that so many of us fall into. Yeah. So number one, I believe that everyone with the exception of like someone who got in a really bad accident, lost their legs. That's not their fault. Nothing like that. Otherwise, for the most part, 90%, let's say everyone is where they're supposed to be in life because that's where they got themselves to. Right. So if I, when I was younger, if I would have just said, no, I'm going to hang out and be lazy, my life would not be what it is today. My kids' life, they wouldn't even, I wouldn't have had four kids if I would have not been able to. So I would stop and say, here's where I'm at. Why am, am I happy with this? Could it be better? Could it be worse? Whatever. Why am I here? And all, all that credit and all that blame is yours. It's no one else's. Why are you here? Well, let's see. Do you spend? Because I think if I looked at someone's spending and I looked at, their calendar, I can tell you where they are in life, right? I, and let's say everybody had to document how much Netflix they had watched for the day, right? If, if I got <laughs> to see all of that, I would probably be able to, within a, a margin of error, be able to predict what that person's life is like. So analyze what you're doing and what, and guess what? What everybody else is doing out there is wrong because that would put you average. And to me, average is unacceptable. So that's what everybody does. You know, you, you have to, I heard this once when I had a job and I worked in a cubicle. And I heard this girl next to me, who I didn't even know. It's cubicle wall, corporate America, just work. And I heard her saying on the phone, oh, guess what? Next month is my last car payment. And I heard that and I go, good for her. I'm so happy for her. And then she goes, no, of course. Of course I'm getting a new car next month. And I said, oh my God, that's what people do. See, that's <laughs> what they do. Because that's what you're supposed to do. You keep spending, be this consumer, be a puppet in this whole play. Don't do that. So that's, the, some, that's some starting advice I would give is, Take a look at where you are. And then there's some weird people like me who've done it way different outside the box. And it's worked really well. 
And I don't know anybody, and, and along those lines of being smart with your money, I'm yet to find the person who says, God, those 10 years where I really grinded and saved all that money, boy, do I regret it. I never have heard that. What I do hear is the opposite. I hear so many older people say, all those years that I wasted so much money, if I'd have known what I know now. So I speak to universities on a regular, uh, before COVID, on a regular basis, never charge. And, and it's because I'm trying to reach some young people who maybe one in a, in a classroom of 300 might hear that and say, I'm going to try it like this crazy guy says and do it a different way. And hopefully that gets them on a different trajectory. I love that because my follow-up question is actually a direct question that someone has told me, they've said to me, and I'm going to let you say the answer because my answer will probably be similar to yours. But they said, what if I put my head down I grind for the 10 years and I don't get there. They're so concerned with those 10 years going by, they put their, their head down and they're concerned with losing out on their mid twenties to mid thirties, the best years of their lives. The 25 to 35 is so precious. They're afraid that if they really put everything they can into what they're going for, it might not pan out. What would you tell that person that's so afraid to give 120%? Yeah. So that's a tough one because, um, man, 20s for me were not the best. Late 30s, I'm 46 now. The next 50 years are going to be phenomenal, all because I made this small sacrifice in the beginning of a decade, let's say. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I didn't regret any of it while I was doing it. I don't feel that, oh, man, I missed that party where everybody got stoned and drunk. Oh, really? That's, that's, if that's where your priorities are? Go do that. Go get stoned. Go get drunk. Go do all of that. But then you're going to regret it when you're 40. Because I hear it all the time. People my age, a lot of them regret that that's what they did, that they partied, that they did all this crazy stuff. Or not crazy. Maybe they just wasted time. They spent all day watching TV. They, they were on social media all day. You're, I think for the most part, people will regret that. You know, you can find your balance. I was anything but balanced. I did not want to be balanced because I, I like to swing one way or the other. I swung toward ridiculous hard work because I knew I wasn't going to work forever. I hate working. And now I don't work anymore. And I get to really enjoy level at a, a life at a level that I never even knew was possible. I seriously go to things. My athletic club that I go to, I go there and I can't believe. Oh, really? But you give you give me. I can take ten towels. You give me twenty razors. I can keep them. You give me all this. I can't believe life is even like that, right? Because I grew up the way I grew up. So to sacrifice a little bit and 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 hurt a little bit. It's just like bodybuilding. If somebody's a bodybuilder and they work really hard in the gym. They're not missing out on anything. They're being healthy so they can win Mr. Olympia, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, those type of stories where Arnold Schwarzenegger gave a speech and he said to the people who just want to sleep more and do this, he said his recommendation was sleep faster, you know, get it over with, go do all the hard work because it's so worth it. You know, 10 years of hard work for 80 years of enjoyment. I, I like that trade-off. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I don't know anything or anyone that's been consistent for 10 years and didn't accomplish it. And I'm not, yeah. so, I'm not promising uh, success to anyone who's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be an NBA player and tell them to dribble a ball for 10 years. They're going to be in the NBA. No, 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 no. But I can tell you this. If you dribble a ball for 10 years and you focus on that craft, you might be one of the best dribble coaches out there. You might be able to make a career around the sport, but doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be in it the way you want. So I, I agree wholeheartedly with you're more likely to regret that time than you are to, to um, I guess, on the opposite end, waste it. Because there really is no wasting it because the fruits that, that come from it are going to be yours and yours to keep. Um, yeah, I know but that's why also it's hard, yeah. it's hard to say 10 years. What if just sit, work really hard for six months and save money and see what happens and then see what you could do with that little victory. You go, wow, I have 10,000 or 5,000 in the bank. What can I do with that? Ah, I can put it here, let that go for the next three years and it's going to make me this much while I keep working. And then you get a little bit of those victories under your belt and it motivates you to just keep going. Yeah, no, I, I love that because <laughs> I have a thing I always call, I call it hashtag stay broke where I make saving money just to have it and an automated thing and for folks that watch us on youtube this computer behind me it's brand new i could have bought it a while ago i saved for a year and a half not because i didn't have the money but because i said hey let's let's make this a game let's put a little bit every every little bit see how much i had and just like you when i had a thousand saved up uh, i wanted to wait when i had 1500 saved up let, let me wait when i finally got to the point of taking the money i couldn't find what i wanted to spend the money on until 
preparation meant opportunity and it, and it worked out. So for anybody that at home wants to start small, maybe make a game of, of saving a little few bucks here and there. There's plenty of apps that will do it for you and, and see what happens as that money starts to grow. Just watch how uh, connected you are to it in terms of knowing the work that went into saving it. And you don't want to just throw it to a Netflix subscription, right? You want, you're going to want to put it sort of something you really want. Uh, Joel, last question, uh, and this is a kind of a personal life question in terms of business is you know, what is one of the major life lessons you've learned that apply to business? Because I know we always talk about business lessons that apply to life, right? Uh, they're very interchangeable. And being as someone who wants to excel in all areas of life, you say how you do one thing is how you do everything. What's something you've learned in life, whether it be through uh, marriage, your, your parenting, or, or anything with, with your personal experiences that would apply very well in business? Yeah, there's a, a lot because I find so many things interconnected. The examples I gave earlier of running long distance and of jujitsu, they go perfectly with life. Guys who are in the gym every day training jujitsu, you start noticing their belt changes colors because they're getting better and you fight them and man, they got, they're getting better. Or somebody who doesn't come that often and they used to beat you, you now see that you're surpassing them, right? Same thing goes for life and all the skills that come with it. Um, but if I was going to sum up a lot of life skills and that apply to life and business and do really well, I like to recommend books because I read a lot of books. And one that I think should be mandatory reading to graduate high school is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Mm -hmm. And what a skill to be able to sell yourself, to convince people to do everything you want. I don't mean manipulation or anything mean. It's just you treat people so well and so nice that they want to work with you. They want to help you. They want to see you succeed. But see, it only works for authentic people. Right. So Ted, if I look you in the eyes and I'm there and I put my hand on your shoulder, you're going to know it's authentic. If I go, Ted, I want the best for you. You're going to feel that. Mm -hmm. That's what that book teaches. Things like that. It won't work for the guy who reads it and fakes it because he doesn't feel it. You got to feel it. If you're a sincere person who cares about people, who likes to connect with people, don't be shy about it. Go out and connect with people. That's why I recommend that book because it's a life changer. It was for me. It made me realize I don't have to be shy. I could do a talk like this. I could go meet people. And if I could bring more value to people, then my life will be better. So that that's a lesson that I've learned about life. And it really pays off in business as well. Yeah, no, so true. Someone once told me, you know, we're always, we're limited by what we can do and what we can control. But the things that are limitless are the amount of people we meet and the things that they know and they can do. And he said, if he were to start over with the success and the, the money he's been able to accrue through his life, he said, the question wouldn't be how, but who. And I would literally start meeting people and, and applying my skills to what they have going on and vice versa and just build a community through that. Joel Gandara, it's been, it's been a pleasure for, for the past 30 minutes, just getting an insight to the, the work ethic, the, the consistency, the drive, the focus, and, and really all, all the gears that went behind your success. We appreciate you pulling back the curtains for that. And I want to make sure that our, our audience, I, you, know, I didn't mention, you mentioned you do uh, entrepreneur coaching and things like that. Any one of our audience who might be looking to, to take their business to that next level, scale up, or maybe just follow some of what you're doing and, and learn from afar, I'd love for them to have access to you and your platform. So how can folks reach out and connect? Sure. Uh, my website is joelgandara.com, and it's J-O-E-L, Gandara, G-A-N-D-A-R-A. And also, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. If you go to my website and you join the mailing list, you're going to get four emails a year. There's no funnel. There's no hard selling. There's no selling. It's just a newsletter that I talk about what's going on in my life and what successes I'm having with my family, my teams, and that sort of thing. And that's it. I'm not, I don't need the money for coaching. I don't need the money at all. I do it because I absolutely love it. So if anyone really feels a need that they want to connect that way, connect. If not, just look me up online and, and say hello. Yeah. Going for the growth. Joel, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate it. I'm going to recap some of the gems you dropped along the way, which I'll be, I'll be honest, there were a lot. My pen almost ran out of ink over here. Um, but I just want to make sure that our listeners were able to catch it. In case they were cleaning, driving in the car while listening, I understand they don't always have a pen and paper. But it all started with, I didn't want to be here. 
understand our surroundings. And it's also true to a lot of folks kind of looking around and noticing that they've been on a hamster wheel their whole lives. Well, if you don't want to be here, the power to move is within your hands. And, and Joel recognized that at a young age, and that put the, the fire under his butt to really start getting going into that entrepreneurial mindset, which allowed him to buy his first house at 22. I bought my first house at 32. Well, uh, yeah, 31, moved in at 32. So just goes to show you what that kind of thought process and mindset can have. Um, put the lead down, go to work. There's a lot of things that we can learn from our parents, one of which that Joel and I can both probably attest to is the amount of work ethic it took for our parents to provide a life for us. And that taught us work ethic, which is a great thing, but it can only take us so far because as Joel is able to step away from his businesses, you don't want to work tirelessly your whole life. That's not going to be the reward you're looking for. Uh, do the math. So many of us have a goal, an ambition. I want to be financially free. What's the number for that? Or, you know, I want a nice car. Well, how much is it going to cost you? I want the nice house. How much does it cost? Now, when you get the number for financial freedom, the house or the car, what is your income? How long is it going to take you to get there? How much money do you have to make? In what increments? The math is going to break it down into steps and the steps become actionable tasks in front of you. It becomes a plan. And when it becomes a plan, it becomes possible. So without the math, it's just a dream. Clarity of desire. So some of us don't do the math because we don't know what it is we want yet. And to a lot of folks, it might take some, some introspective work. It might take a little bit of time, but when you find out what it is you truly want, you find out what to aim for and, and then you start going after it. And if you're not sure what to aim for, just try shooting at something and eventually you'll get confident with your aim and then you'll really get excited to what you aim for next. Don't waste time. So many of us probably can do away with some net less Netflix or you don't have to watch squid game or all that. You don't have to be up to date on the, on the current trends that will be there when you're done. Maybe, maybe focus on what's a priority first. And, and finally kind of going, coming through some of the notes, because there were so many gems you're, you're going to regret that I wrote, that you're going to regret that because right now you have a choice. You have a choice to chase the life that you say you want or continue to live the life that you currently have. Not that there's anything wrong with that. If you are happy, I'm happy. If you like it, I love it. But if there's something that you are desiring outside of what you currently have, the choice in front of you is right now, whether you work and you take action towards it, or if you wait and maybe procrastinate a little bit long, either way, the choice is yours. And as we kind of recap, as you speak to those older than you, ahead of you, farther down the line than you, you're more likely to regret that than enjoy it. Guys, we appreciate the episode that you guys joined us for. We appreciate Joel sharing with us throughout the last 30 minutes. And as always, if you got value from this, please share it with a friend, uh, share it with someone you know can get value from it and leave us a rating. Let us know how we're doing. It's the only way we can improve and get better. And as always, you can also subscribe to our Patreon page for some extra behind the scenes audio from our guests like Joel and others. As we always say at the end of the episode, guys, Everybody wants the sunshine, but they don't want the rain, but you can't get the pleasure without a little pain. Let's grow.